Amen. You want to turn in your Bible to Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 9. And I'll go ahead and read the question. And we will go from there. Hi. The question reads this way. It's a very long uh, paragraph. Then actually the question... There's two questions at the bottom. So I'll go through the paragraph first. Then we'll get to the questions. We know that God's people during the Old Testament times could be forgiven of their sins. Exodus 22, 32, 1 Kings 8, 37 through 40. And in Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 through 12 reads, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 10 says this, Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 8 through 9, 18 through 19 reads, Now all these things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself and not imputing their trans trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Okay. We got all that? Here comes the questions. If the law could not justify the Israelites, nor were they in a state of reconciliation with God as Christians are today, what was their state? And then the second one, if one died under the law, did his soul exist in a state of non-reconciliation until the cross? Let's deal with the first one first. If the law could not justify the Israelites, nor were they in a state of reconciliation with God as Christians are today, what was their state or condition? A holding pattern until the cross. Okay. Uh, Galatians three eleven and twelve, Romans five nine through ten, and Second Corinthians five, verses eighteen and So one answer uh, has been given as a holding pattern. What was the condition of the Israelites, spiritually speaking, before Christ came? Right. Blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It's definitely uh, stated uh, quite clearly in the book of Hebrews. Anything else? Right. 
the animal sacrifices were there, definitely under the uh, patriarchy system from the foundation of the world, uh, and also for the Gentiles. Um, but then Moses comes along with the Mosaic system, and they had a sacrificial system that has some similarities to the patriarchal sacrificial system. You find that in the book of Leviticus. So that's a good point. It's, yeah, that's part of the question, too. Basically, the question, if I can just summarize the question, is what was their spiritual condition before Christ came, and when they died, what was their spiritual condition then? Okay, so the concept of we're in a temporal, we're in a time frame, whereas there may be in the spiritual realm a more instantaneous uh, timelessness, so to speak, outside of what we understand. Yes? Um, I think you're ta- uh, thinking about um, Matthew's account where it speaks of those who've died and there were some bodies that died in Jerusalem or some people and the graves were open when that earthquake took place and their bodies came forth. So it said some of the saints that died and they went into the city and appeared to many. Um, that definitely did happen. There might be a significance to that. Anything else? That's a good point. Uh, Christ is that per- perfect sacrifice. Uh, he, in essence, brought an end to the, all the sacrifices by his sacrifice on the cross. Therefore, the, really, that's a, 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 the point of the book of Hebrews. There's no need for those animal sacrifices anymore because Christ is that once for all, all sufficient sacrifice uh, that all those animal sacrifices pointed to in the first place. Let, let me ask you this. Is there anyone from the Old Testament period that we know for sure, without a doubt, will be in heaven? That's, that's one I wasn't thinking about, but that's, that's a good point. Enoch was taken. That, that's a good point, too. Uh, he was of the patriarchal period. But one uh, I'm specifically talking about that uh, the Bible in the New Testament shows us. 
Who? Abraham. Abraham. Luke 16. The rich man and Lazarus. And, and uh, Lazarus dies poor and is taken, his spirit is taken by angels into Abraham's bosom, which we know in other places is referred to as paradise. Jesus called it paradise in uh, Luke 23. So we can say, based on that, the condition of Abraham, spiritually speaking, what his condition is right now to this very moment, we know, and I didn't even think about the other two that were mentioned, Enoch and Elijah, we know that they were taken. Uh, but we know, we have a picture, so to speak, in Luke 16, of a righteous man in a righteous condition. This is prior to the cross. So when Abraham died, his spirit was taken into paradise. So he died in a saved condition. The question is, how can that be before Christ died? Mm -hmm. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. And for this reason, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal, eternal inheritance. Now here he's talking about Jesus in the whole context here of Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. He's talking about how Jesus' sacrifice and his priesthood is far superior to that of the Old Testament. In fact, all of those things pointed forward to Christ. And we're told here in verse 15, He's the mediator, that's a go-between of the New Covenant, that's what we have in the New Testament of Jesus, by means of death, a death goes into effect, or a testament, a covenant goes into effect when a person dies, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. The first covenant there refers to what? The Old Testament. Law of Moses. So what we have here is the Hebrews writer is telling us that when Christ died, His blood not only takes care of people after Him, but before Him. And so, illustrated up here on the board with this timeline, this representing the beginning of the world and this to the very point we are now, when Jesus died, the cross representing His death, the blood goes both ways. Both ways. So that Abraham and any faithful person, when they are... When they die in a saved condition, are, die, are, are, are saved because of the blood of Jesus. Now, did he understand that? There's no way he could have understood that. And he knew that in him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That was a promise given to him in um, Genesis chapter 12. In you, he told Abram, all nations of the earth will be blessed in your seed, in your descendant. Of course, you get to Galatians 3, you find out that seed is talking about Christ. Well, Abram didn't fully understand that. He didn't fully understand. He, didn't, he died not knowing what all that meant. However, when he was obedient to God with a sincere, obedient faith under the patriarchy system, by which God gave instructions on how to sacrifice, what to do, how to live, morality. You know, morality existed before the law of Moses because of the concept of uh, adultery and things like that that's found in the book of uh, Genesis. So there was laws of morality there uh, for the patriarchs and a standard by which they lived. When they lived according to that and they sacrificed according to those uh, instructions, they were not saved by the blood of that animal. They were saved by the 
what that blood represented. The blood of Christ. In the same way today, when a person is baptized, they're not saved by the water. But they're saved by the death of Christ. That's why a person is baptized into Christ. Galatians or Romans 6, 1 through 6. Because that's where he shed his blood. So, that is the point there of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. That the death of Christ took care of the sins of the faithful in the first covenant. So when a person died in the first covenant, they could be, they could die in a saved condition even though the death of Christ hadn't taken place yet. And I believe the best way to illustrate that is how we use a credit card today. We can purchase something with a credit card, but the payment's not going to be made till next month. And so we, we, we purchase it. We say, look at this item that I bought. Take it home with you. It's yours. It's in your possession. But you haven't paid for it yet. In the same way, when God forgave people under the Old Covenant, it was on credit, so to speak. The payment would be made when Jesus dies on the cross. And that would cancel out all of their sin debt. His blood. So it wasn't the animals that did it. It was not the blood of bulls and goats that could take away sins. We understand that. But they had to have obedient faith from a sincere heart under the covenant, whether it be patriarchy, whether it be the Mosaic, for them to benefit from God's grace and mercy. That's why we find in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, faith all of fame. By faith, they did this, this, and this. By faith, they obeyed. By faith, they went out. By faith, they... It's all by faith. So they couldn't put their trust and their hope in the animal they were sacrificing, but their hope and their trust was in the coming Messiah, his, his redemption that he would provide. So look at Romans chapter 3 as we consider this also. Paul talks about this in Romans 3. <coughs> Look at verse 23, talking about the sinful condition of men. Uh, for all of sin fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously previously committed. In other words, God had a, a, a forbearing plan to bring about redemption. And at just the right time, Galatians 4.4, 4, uh, when it talks about uh, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. In the right time in human history, Jesus came. So in his forbearance, he passed over the sins that were previously committed. That means he forgave, but the payment would be on his son. Forbearance. Now God could have been perfectly just to have every person that violated the law of Moses sent to torment. He would have been perfectly just to do that. I mean, you think of the best person you could come up with in the Old Testament. Uh, Abraham would be one of the top ones. Uh, Joseph was a pretty outstanding individual. They still had their faults. God would have been perfectly just to condemn them to eternal punishment for their sins. He would have been perfectly within his divine right to do so. But he set up a sacrificial system by which they could be forgiven before the payment was made. Now here's the difference in us and them. They look forward to it, not fully, under, not fully understanding it. They look forward to a coming Messiah with all the prophecies. Isaiah 53, 
in Psalm 22 and others talk about the death of Christ. They look forward to it without understanding the full. We look back on it. We, we realize the fact has happened. To them, it, has, it was not a reality. To us, it's a fact of history. So everything that we do, think about it, looks back. The Lord's Supper, what does it do? It looks back to the cross. Baptism, what does it do? It looks back to the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 6. Everything looks back to something we already know has taken place. So that back to Romans 3, 25. In his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God can be just and the justifier at the same time because Jesus was that propitiation, that sacrifice that was made in our place, our substitute our sin bearer, our sacrifice, our atonement, and Jesus. That being the case, every person that's going to be in heaven is going to be there because of the blood of Jesus. We're talking about accountable people. Every sinner that's redeemed that's going to be in heaven is going to be there because of the blood of Jesus. From the Old Testament throughout the New. That's how powerful the sacrifice was. I think some people have the misunderstanding that God just forgave and forgave and forgave and, and forgave with each with each sacrifice and He just forgave. And then He said, okay, I'll send my Son and we won't have to do this anymore. And then He sent His Son and that forgave everyone from that point on. That's not how it works. It went both ways. Because you can't get to heaven based upon... Uh, a carnal system like uh, sacrificing animals. That was a holding pattern, as Ned put it, for the time being, so that there could be the ultimate sacrifice. Yes? Right. Exactly. Job 19 and verse 25. Here's Job. Job could be the oldest book in the Bible. It might be older than Genesis in the fact that Job was a part of the patriarch. And so we have to understand the books in the Bible are not arranged chronologically in the time period in which they were written. Uh, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, and Job lived before Moses somewhere probably around the time of Abraham. And notice what uh, Job says there in Job uh, 19 and verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, verse 26, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. He had a hope of a resurrection too. My Redeemer, I know he lives, and he will stand upon the earth. Now, Job did not fully comprehend everything about that. But we can go back and say, yes, he has come. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us that. The Redeemer has come. He has stood upon the earth. And so there, there is the difference. Um, the, the very fact that we have that window into the condition of the dead who die before the cross in Luke chapter 16 shows their spiritual condition. That they are in a condition of, of comfort. They are in paradise. Now with the resurrection of Christ and his ascension, that gives us hope of a resurrection ourselves and for us to be in heaven someday in a, a different condition that we are in now. Uh, speaking of a, a spiritual resurrection, so to speak, 1 Corinthians 15. So, th this is, I think, uh, the answer to the, the, the question. If the law 
could not justify the Israelites, nor were they in a state of reconciliation with God as Christians are, what was their state? They were forgiven, they died saved, but not as Christians are. We're saved, but not as they were. They were saved, not as we are, and we are saved, not as they were. Different covenant. But it all goes back to sincere, obedient faith. From the time of patriarchy, time of Moses, to now. Sincere, obedient faith under whatever covenant we are under. You can't just go through the motions uh, if you lived under the law of Moses. How many times did God condemn Israel for just going through the motions? Over and over again throughout the prophets, you're just going through the motions. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 1, God says, take it away. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear your worship. I don't want your sacrifices, your solemn oaths. It's making me sick, basically, is what he's saying, because they were not sincere. They were corrupt. They didn't do it in proper faith. But they were going through the right motions. And God said, take it away. He didn't accept it then. Does he accept it now? Now? We just go through the motions? No. He wants us to be sincere. To have a sincere, obedient faith so that when we do follow the pattern of the New Testament, it's an acceptable spiritual sacrifice to him. So God doesn't change. The covenants change. But God's expectation of his people never change. Sincere, obedient faith. Abel had it. Noah had it. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph. Others had it. And that is what pleases God. And God has provided salvation through His Son. Any more on that before we go any further? shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So there had to be a, a continual picture before the people. There has to be something that dies and sheds its blood. And that was a, a, a picture of Jesus, like a visual aid, so to speak, of Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the, the baptizer said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that all that pointed to Jesus, all the sacrifices, even the non-animal sacrifices, you had drink offerings, uh, grain offerings, and the book of Leviticus, they all, every single sacrifice of the Old Testament and the, and the patriarch, patriarchy, all pointed to Christ, all of them. Something has to be sacrificed in order for there to be forgiveness. Right. Exactly. The the. Right. Something had to die. Something had to die to adequately cover them. And in a spiritual sense, for us to be clothed with, with a, a, a righteousness and forgiveness and, and, and to, be, to be right with God, something had to die. Someone had to die. 
And that's the point of the animal sacrifices uh, to the extent that they're explained to us. I believe that everything in the, the, the tabernacle pointed forward to what we have in the new covenant today. And it was like uh, God was showing his scheme of redemption to Israel in that pattern. And it should have been something for them to say, look, when Christ came, that's exactly what we saw in the pattern of the tabernacle. Christ came, died, shed his blood, the, the cleansing in the, in, in the water, that's baptism, um, all the other things. Jesus is now in the Holy of Holies, heaven. All those things should have pointed and helped them to realize that, and I think for some of them it did um, help, them, help to convert them. Okay, we ready to move on to the next question? In the time that we have, we're going to get in probably two two questions. They both deal with music. First question is this. Is the position of a song leader biblical? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just reading it. <laughs> That's a good point. There'd be confusion without a song leader. There might be some within the... Uh, um, Examples within the Levitical worship, and they, they had choirs, actually, in the Levitical system. They had choirs and instrumental music, and they would have a song director. Um, and some of the psalms, it talks about to the director of this and that. Um, so there, there's a point there. Right. So there is a song leader, but not officially before the assembly, so to speak. Anything else? Anyone else? I think, I think so. 1 Corinthians 14 deals with the church assembly and how there's to be order in the way things are done. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Verse 40, as you stated, let all things be done decently and in order. So he's dealing here with the the use of the spiritual gifts that existed in the first century, but certainly there is a principle there for us as we use our natural abilities um, in, in the light of the full revelation of God's Word to uh, worship God and to conduct a worship service. Um, I would not say that the song leader is a position. Um, I would have to 
I'd have to wonder what was meant by the word position. Um, but as far as having someone, uh, a man, and we know the principle of male leadership in, in the assembly from First Timothy 2, the men are to take the lead. The males, that's the Greek word there for, for males, they are to lead in, in an assembly of mixed genders. So um, there has to be someone to do that. Or you could have confusion. We don't want to get here. We would actually violate Scripture if we got here unprepared. We would actually violate Scripture if we got here, came here and said, okay, who's going to lead singing? And then two or three got up and said, oh, I will, I will. And there's confusion. That would be the opposite of what Paul said. So to have one man say, okay, I'm going to lead this Sunday and, 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 you know, another, so, okay, I'll lead next Sunday or whatever. Or I've been at congregations where there have been one man get up and lead, sit down, another man get up and lead and sit down. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. Um, of course, we do that on Wednesday night when we have our singing Wednesday night, which is going to be next week. So um, I wouldn't say it's a position like being an elder or a deacon. Certainly not. You don't find that in the Bible. But it's just one of the Christian men getting up and, and leading the songs. And he is not, he is nothing but the leader. The church is to all be singing together with him. And in fact, if things were done as they ought to, the church ought to be drowning him out as we worship God in spirit and in truth with a vocal uh, uh, volume of our vocal uh, abilities in which we reflect the joy and adoration we have in our heart towards God, we should should be drowning out the song leader. Um, That doesn't happen always, but that's something we're working on. Uh, so the song leader uh, situation is is something that is part of the concept of having things done uh, decently in order. Uh, preparing, right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So preparing is is a very good point. We need to be preparing. And a lot of times, sometimes uh, the the preacher will get with the song leader to kind of coordinate songs with a lesson. And that that always goes great uh, in a worship service because the songs are part of the teaching as long as uh, along with the sermon itself. So it's, it's not a position in the sense of being an elder or a deacon. It's just one of the men that's leading the songs. Did you know being a preacher is not a position either? Preacher's not in a position. He's just one of the members that preaches. It's not a position. The eldership is called an office or a position in which there are qualifications for a man to have. So there, there's a difference there. Uh, in the words. Yes. You're talking about like a solo? Okay, uh, on display, I think that would be a a pride problem. I think that would be a an attitude of of showcasing their voice, whereas that should not that should not be the case. Um, a a song leader should be leading the congregation, not not being 
so loud. And I've been to places where the, the mic was turned up so loud as he was leading, you could pretty much only hear him because the, the system was up so loud and he was he was so loud and that was that was in their eyes perfectly acceptable. But in that that shouldn't be. He should not be showcasing his voice. You know, he should be up there leading and, and trying to, to get the congregation to lead uh, with him and um, of course, we can't look into a person's heart. And some people are, are naturally loud, especially when they sing. And so that should be incentive for us if, 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 if there's a song leader that's loud to get as loud as he is or louder. I mean, we should in, I've always said we need to increase the volume anyway. Uh, we need to uh, reflect the joy and the adoration we have in our hearts through our voice. So... Right. Mm-hmm. Right. There would be times when songs had to be taught, and uh, if it was in a, a class like setting, I would think that the song leader would have to teach a song by singing it. And then the congregation uh, join in. So th- there would be times when there were, were not song books. And so you're listening to the song leader to, and he wants you to listen to it. And when you get it, pick up and come along with him. But he's teaching a song that's new to everyone else. Let me get this one in very quickly because i got very short time because it deals with music. My family was listening to a cappella music when a song came on that had vocally produced instrumental sounds. Does the Bible say anything about this? <laughs> well, since I'm, I'm pressed for time here, and we can elaborate on this one the next time we get together. It's next Sunday night. I'll be singing night. Um, the Bible says sing. It says to speak. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, and verse 16. If I'm mimicking an instrument, I am not speaking. I'm not uh, teaching. We're to teach with our songs. You teach with words. You don't teach when you make verbal sounds. Uh, we have a, a CD in our car. It has children's songs on it. And on very few of the songs, there's maybe 60-something songs on there, they will, do, uh, a, a, they will mimic a drum with their voice. It's all vocal. When we get to that song, we skip it. Because I don't want Seth or Maya to think that's proper in worship to God. And I, I want them to realize that, that that's not right. The same way in some of the songs there's clapping. We skip those songs. Because that's not authorized. You know, listening to a CD, we have to be very careful um, that, you know, we're not sympathetic to something that's being done that's wrong. Uh, that we're not listening to something that is uh, incorrect. Now, you have to make the decision whether that's going to be something you're going to continue to listen to whether it will influence you or not. But um, a lot of liberalism enters into the church by some of the things that we do outside the assembly that somehow trickles into the assembly eventually. Because we start to justify it outside the main assembly, all of a sudden it becomes okay in the assembly over time and we have to be very careful so the Bible doesn't say anything about us um, making musical sounds it tells us what to do with our voice to sing to teach to admonish and if we do if we simply get up there and and do what the Bible says as far as songs we're just going to sing like we do here 
I mean, how, how much instruction would you get if I stood up here as your teacher and went, boom, 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 boom? Is that going to help you spiritually grow if I get up here and make noises? Well, singing is part of the teaching process. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, and verse 16. So my advice would be, when you get to that song, skip it. Go to a song where they're all singing according to uh, the, the New Testament pattern. Next week, we'll not be here because uh, I'm going to be speaking at uh, Centerville at their summer series. So uh, it's singing next week anyway. So uh, we'll take up this study the following week afterwards.